thanking uh, the Society for Photographic Education, who we remain affiliated with and who has been generous enough to let us use their Zoom account. SPE is a member-based organization for those who aren't uh, familiar and will be dropping their website in the chat window momentarily. A few protocols. Um, again, if you're new to Photofica, um, please do put your name and email address in the chat window. You can direct that to me and I will make sure that you are added to our mailing list um, and that provides us an opportunity to contact with you uh, or to have updates with you directly. Um, however, we will always do the same um, uh, updates on social media as well. Uh, we'll ask that now um, that you all put yourselves on mute um, so that we can start our meeting um, with a bit of a presentation. Today's a little bit more informal um, than uh, we've been, um, but we'll still start in that same uh, particular format. And then we'll open it up to the larger audience um, in, in, a, in a short while. Um, once we do wrap up that uh, presentation um, portion, do stick around for informal conversation. Um, and we do um, like to capture um, any uh, um, significant content in the chat window. So if you have a question um, or uh, pertinent information, please um, do use the chat window to uh, um, make sure that content is captured. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Um, I say this every time we've done this, so we are establishing the way to move forward in this shifting time and we can do this together. So before I pass it over to uh, Betsy, Betsy has asked me to share something with you all. So I'm gonna do that. Give me just one second. For those of you who have not already seen this. Who would like to go next for critique? I think of next. Uh, this is my two-day figure painting study. I think it was really good practice. Please don't take this the wrong way, but I just wanted to say you don't know what you're talking about. It's 9 a.m. Uh, thank you for the note. I love that you censored his manhood, yet he's grabbing a staff so eagerly. It's both ironic and erotic. Cool. I um, actually just accidentally spilled coffee on his um noodle right before class, so I put a smiley face there. Have you considered painting nude? I like the colors. Thank you. But I hate that you use paint. It's a painting class. Wait, what did you use? Blood. Really good points, everybody. Tyler, I think you should consider painting nude. You're so tense, like a little clam. Don't be afraid to get vulnerable. Quick cigarette break, everybody. When we get back, we have 23 more paintings to go through. All right, over to Betsy. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so yeah, uh, I, a, st a former student of mine sent me that, um, actually Reagan, I don't know if any of you know her, anyway, sent me that uh, a couple weeks ago and I thought it was hilarious. So I thought I'd, I would show it maybe to my intro photo students who didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't get any of it. And I mean, of course, it's, I realize in some ways it's dated, even though it was just made and it's specific to art school. And then I realize the only line that is familiar for me of my critiques right now are, I like the colors. Um, and it's true that that's, it's, it's a little hyperbolic and it's very art school focused. I haven't probably taught in a place where the critiques are like that in a while. Um, but it made me think about a lot of things. It started me thinking more about critique, which I've been thinking about ever since I started teaching online. I think before that, I just took it for granted. I took it for granted that what I did in the classroom was good and it was right and I followed my instincts. Um, and then being online forced me to rethink. And then when I first started teaching, well, online, it's always been a, a, a dilemma to get students to engage critically. Um, it's, I think, and I think there are a number of factors uh, why students aren't able to do much beyond, say, like, or now I realize beyond just being nice to each other. Um, and it's not just about content, and I realize now it's not just online. Um, for me, it's happening in person more and more. Um, I think for a while I thought it was just a, a problem that was there because of, as we know, all the things that happen through distance. I mean, I am now teaching in person and online, but in person through masks. And any of you who are teaching in person know that that 
that does make it harder to read their emotions. Um, but I think that there's a lot of factors that are um, making critique what it is right now. Um, and one of the things we were talking about before, before the, this, before the people joined was about um, what's the function of critique right now? I mean, and I think it might have a different, slightly different function right now. I mean, I think we're all feeling pretty vulnerable and I, we've been saying this for months, but I, I think, you know, winter's coming, um, the election's next week, um, pandemic's resurging. I mean, I think we're all feeling like really, really vulnerable. And it's making me think a lot about what my responsibility is to my students. And at the core, I do think getting them to think critically is really our most important mission, um, you know, and but I'm, I'm just not, I'm a little bit at a loss right now of how to make critiques work. I think there's a number of, of challenges. Uh, oh yeah, and then also somebody posted, somebody posted right on photography professors that Terry Barrett, the card with both kind of formulas, um, well, ideas for how, how to lead a successful critique. And Rebecca Modrak uh, wrote on, on, the, on the, not the chat, but on the comments about how important silence was. And it will be no surprise to those of you who know me that I am not one of those professors who can sit through silence, any silence. <laughs> it, it makes my screen, skin crawl. And it's, it's partly my style, but it's, it's got me thinking too about how to deal with those spaces um, and, and a lot of reasons of what's, what's important for us as, um, as professors and as facilitators of critique. Uh, and then a, another thing that's come come to the front, um, Anne, early at the end of the summer, had us watch um, The Room of Silence, which if you haven't seen it, you all, everyone should watch it. It's interviews with um, RISD students, students of color, talking about what it's like to be critiqued. And it's, you know, it was one of the, like, kind of, it's eye-opening. And I think, right, oh, I think I was progressive and paying attention and listening to that, it was really clear that there are a lot of things that, that I don't know what to do or I don't always do the right thing. I mean, different people are different, obviously, right? And that's part of what I think is so important about critique is that there, it shouldn't be formulaic and it, we should be responding to different students. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say just a few more things and then I'll, I'll end. I remember once, like 10 years ago at, at ASU, one of my one of the stronger students was really he was kind of mad at me because we had this weak student who was phoning it in and he's like you know why aren't you harder on her like why did you like why you know and, and i had probably spent two or three times as much critiquing this person as i had the person he was complaining about and i i had to make him realize well i'm investing in you <laughs> i don't she's not investing in her work. And so like, like, and for him, it was the, the calculation that, that, you know, he was getting evaluated, right? He was putting it up on the wall and it was like, is it good or bad? And the fact that, that I was pushing him harder and I was, I was, I saw that he could take it and he needed it, um, was it's, it was been part of my, always part of my strategy is, you know, you, you, you invest the time in the students who are investing the time and the ones who can, can take it, the ones who want it, the ones who are receptive. Um, and I mean, not to say that I short shrift the other ones, but I do think that that's part of what's so great about critique is that, that we are, we're able to respond to the people that are there and meet them where they are, right? And, and, and so I'm just gonna pull that back into to questions because I think there's a lot of questions in terms of platform, in terms of online, in terms of, and Anne brought up the trophies for all culture that a lot of these kids are coming from now where they're really used to, or the idea of the shit sandwich, right? Where you're supposed to say something nice and then something critical and then something nice. Um, come on, <laughs> really? Like grow up a little bit. But on the, then you have this vulnerable student in front of you that, that's like hurt or they're upset or they're, you know, you know, or their school has just been all, bought out by the school that you're teaching at, which is a situation that's happening right now at Emerson. And like, I mean, that's, 
a silly example, but they're so vulnerable. So I'm going to just throw back the question to, I want to open up a discussion about how to go forward with this. Um, and I think different strategies are really important. I think I am sure that Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca is so much calmer than I am and so much, and you know, I think some people's strategies, like I want to hear all the strategies out there and I want to exchange ideas. And I think we all need to become the best. We need to be present. I mean, this is like everything I've been talking about since the beginning is like fighting against the machine in a way, like fighting to be individuals and to run our classrooms the way we can, despite everything, despite technology, despite administrations. Um, and I do think the critique space is, is kind of the central space where that happens. Um, and I, you know, back to that TikTok, we all know like a lot of the bad BS that happens in critiques. And I think that was really funny, but I also think like, we also know that like, when critiques are, are edgy, they can also end up being really, really kind of stupid too. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But I really hope the next, actually the next couple of photo ficas that we can really start talking about this more. Um, and I'd love to hear from other people about strategies, um, teaching online strategies, teaching in person, teaching through COVID, you know, being, you know, how to, um, operate around like a, a, the plurality of voices and respecting people and pushing people at the same time. And this idea of creating a safe space to be unsafe. Um, I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm gonna stop talking, uh, but I'm just, I just wanna throw out, those are just some thoughts that I've had uh, and conversations I'd like, to, I'd like to, to start with all of you. All right, and I'm gonna pass it on to John. Mute, unmute, there we go. Welcome to, uh, you know, our current state of everything. So I'm gonna unpin Anne here. Um, yeah, so I'm John Fryer. Uh, I teach at uh, VCU Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I'm a recent addition to the board of directors for the Society for Photographic Education, uh, which is one of our partners uh, on this project. And you know, in, in response to some of the things that Anne's talking about, um, you know, one of the things that's, that, that we've been trying to do on Photofica uh, is uh, share our experiences and our resources and um, really thinking about the ways that we can adjust how we're doing, what we're doing, what we're showing uh, to really reach our students where they are. Um, and so I've had the great fortune over the last couple of weeks to participate in a number of the um, chapter conferences for the Society for Photographic Education. Uh, and I've posted a few things on the blog. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share my screen uh, just for a little bit to talk about some of the things that we've been, been working on. Um, and let me see here. I have to figure out where that is. All right, so um, let me see here. So one of the things that, that um, you know, one of the things that we focused on uh, this year, so we've been meeting every other week last, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the spring semester, we really were just trying to figure out like, how the hell are we gonna do all of the things that we do in this new space? Um, and what we've been kind of focusing on now is like, what's worked. So our first guest was Marnie Schindelman, who shared this really great assignment with us. Uh, all of those assignments show up uh, on our site uh, that, that people share with us. We, uh, we, we um, uh, met with uh, Edgar Cardenas uh, a few weeks ago, who talked about things that he was doing in the classroom. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, I've been going to uh, the, the chapter conferences for SPE. The next one uh, that's coming up is the Northeast chapter, uh, and that's happening on the 7th of November. So um, one thing that, that SPE's response to, uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm clicking around here, uh, to COVID has been to move everything, uh, at least in the fall, to an online space uh, and 
they had a membership drive, which was very successful, and then to participate in any of the conferences for for uh, for faculty, it was twenty dollars to com, 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 you know participate in all of them. For students, it was five dollars. So it, it was really reasonable in terms of getting engaged. Um, and I posted on the blog uh, about two of the experiences that I had, and 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 the first one um, I'm going to go to um, is. Um, from last week. Uh, so uh, Art Fields um, and, and Lee, uh, Lee Ghosts uh, did a presentation called Walking on Eggshells. And they really talked about uh, ways in which to uh, engage students to create a, a safe space for students, to create a space for students of color, uh, to be able to interact and engage uh, both in the classroom, but also more specifically within this online space that we're in. And one of the things that's been really great for um, that I that I what I love about the situation that we're in with COVID is that the people that I engage with and interact with are so generous with their time uh, and their resources. So one of the things that uh, uh, I've linked to here uh, is this great resource page that that you know is is arts uh, you know few favorite things, uh, including uh, every presentation uh, the presentation that he made last week, um, and uh, you know basically kind of great resources that you can connect to. So if I go to connections, and specifically you know the entire walking on eggshells presentation, uh, there's an inclusive classroom presentation. Uh, uh, you know, Arthur talked a lot about the inclusive, inclusivity uh, photographer database that that Anne has been working on. So, what I what I I'm excited to see the kind of uh, engagement and interaction and 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 sharing uh, that Photofica is really designed to do. So um, I don't know. I mean, so Arthur, I wanted to talk a little bit to him, and I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my screen off just for a second. Uh, because Arthur is somebody that uh, my understanding is that you are teaching remotely from Texas. Is that correct? Let me see if I can unmute you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm so remotely from Texas. Yes. Yeah. So you've been you've been this entire semester uh, been based in Texas, but engaging with synchronous and asynchronous uh, uh, classroom duties as well as. Um, working in an, in an exhibition space, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, so can you talk about some of the strategies that you've used specifically to address the kinds of, you know, I think one of the things that Ann talked about, or excuse me, Betsy talked about was like, you know, uh, you know and, and Rosemary actually before we even started was talking about like how odd it is to try to create rapport uh, in this online space. And one of the other links, let me, I'm going to, I think I'm still sharing my screen. One of the other links that that I was um, one of the other links that I that I'm going to connect to when we get into more conversation is is Nick Shepard did a presentation uh, three weeks ago where he did this really wonderful um, setup in an Airbnb uh, where he had the equipment that was available to him used his phone, used his 5D Mark II, used his computer, and, and went through the entire process of setting up a classroom. And that's something that we've linked to. He's also been using uh, uh, a, a thing called Concept Board uh, that I'll send you all a link to so you can see it. Uh, I fell in love with it as soon as I clicked on one link and I was in the same room uh, with, with as many people that were uh, a part of that presentation. So I'm gonna send a link to that. So. Um, so Arthur, can you talk about, you know, coming into the classroom this spring, uh, and or excuse me, this fall, and 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 doing so from where you are, uh, and engaging with students where they are. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I teach at a small Midwestern university uh, in Indiana, in a small community college uh, atmosphere. Uh, most of my students are first. First, uh, first year students, beginning students. And so um, I teach darkroom normally, 
but all of my darkroom classes, I normally have three darkroom classes a semester, and this semester uh, everything had to go online. And so no darkroom, everything is digital. And so I've had to um, try to teach the exact same skills <laughs> uh, digitally online and as I normally do in the darkroom. And so it's been a challenge to, you know, to give them that same experience. Um, and especially to introduce them to working in the dark room and working in that, uh, in the, and working in that space. And so, um, so one of the things, the challenge, the biggest challenge was actually getting them acclimated to the space and walking them around the space. So, um, I, as I talked about in my presentation the other day, it was more about getting them comfortable enough to ask me questions, getting them comfortable enough to talk in the classroom on in this virtual learning environment um and so um you know what are those icebreakers the same icebreakers and things that we did in class drawing pictures um doing um uh, index card questions you know the pop things that we're good at things that we're bad at um those same icebreaker questions getting them to do that online was actually a little bit easier than i thought it was going to be um you just you know just like somebody was saying earlier being really excited about the work and doing all that, that helps in the beginning of class, especially with new students, uh, newer, younger students. Um, but then now at this point in the semester, this is when it gets hard. <laughs> you know, this part, we're 10 weeks in, we're in week 11 now. And so my students are kind of, I'm here, I'm the upbeat one, so let's do this, let's do that. And you know, they're all like, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> or all of their screens are off. Beginning of the semester, everybody's screens, I can see everybody moving around and I can see everybody smiling. And then now all I see is names, you know? And so how do I do that now? <laughs> and so, um, you know, so it's one of those things where now um, I call on somebody, they turn on their screen, they have to call on the next person. So everybody has to be a little bit more awake and more alive because um, they don't know who they're gonna call on. <laughs> and so that's one of the things that I do to, um, you know, keep things going and, um, you know, it's all because of that original, those original games where students got to know each other, they can, they feel comfortable enough to do that to each other. Um, they're still not as comfortable as when we're in the classroom. Yeah, I still notice that difference. It's a big difference for me. And I miss that camaraderie that we have being in the classroom. But, um, you know, it is what it is. And I'm trying to make the most of it and keep it going as long as I can. But, you know, it's a lot of work for us. You know, yes. <laughs> to always be positive because, you know, we're getting tired, too. And um, but I think it's our job in a way. And that's the way I look at it now is to keep them motivated. And I have to, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard the term fake it till you make it. I'm kind of doing that. <laughs> so that's, you know, basically what I'm doing right now. And yeah, I mean, and, and, and Zoom fatigue is something that we've talked about, uh, you know, on Photofica, and it's something that's real uh, in terms of uh, thinking about the ways that our, that our students engage uh, with us. And also, when they come to us, they've also been uh, on a whole variety of time-sucking, uh, you know, not interesting, not engaging, uh, you know, long-term lectures that, 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 that you know, that they lump, you know, basically we have been as, 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 as teachers that create, that, that teach in the creative space, like we've been put in a position where uh, we're delivering content in ways that, uh, you know, big lecture halls are being delivered, right? So there's a flattening of that, 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 that adds that kind of level of, of fatigue on us uh, without it being uh, anything that we're doing. So, you know, I think, I think one of the things we'd like to talk about is ways that we as educators have, uh, you know, what kind of strategies we've used. So um, I think this would be a good time to, um, let's open up, let's open up uh, um, concept board. So I'm gonna send a link to you and then I'm gonna share the screen uh, just so that we can take a look at it. Uh, and I'm gonna keep, we're gonna keep Arthur here, so. I'm going to share the screen with concept board and let's see. So that link, you should be able to click on that link and, um, and log right in. Oh, here we are. Fantastic. So this was one of the most exciting things for me was to uh, like find this space where, you know, we can move things together 
we can reposition things. So join if you can, if you're interested. Uh, and then we can start to comment things and we can zoom in and we can walk around and we can comment with each other. And it allows, allows people to essentially add images, move things around, um, and be in the same place at the same time. So then, you know, I can, I can go in and say, I want to look at this thing uh, initially. And the thing that I've posted in here, uh, if you haven't been here before, hey, look, everyone's here. Oh, I love this thing. Um, and you can, you know, you can circle things and you can annotate and you can add, you know, so I'll just let the educators do the thing that they do. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the images that you're looking at. So uh, one of the things that we have been working on uh, over the last, since, since, the, since the summer, uh, is this um, the PhotoFika 2020 All-Star Project. So we sent out a, 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 a missive to all of you uh, and to uh, educators across the United States and around the world to have their students submit images to us to be included in a print publication called the PhotoFika All-Stars. So um, the initial part of that, which ended, uh, we kept expanding the deadline, but we ended up getting 400 uh, students from, from MFA programs, BFA, BA, AA programs, people who graduated in 2020. Um, and then um, working with uh, Becky Semp from the Center for Creative Photography, uh, she reached out to 135 uh, curators and artists and people that, that have a connection to the photography world to pick students. So, uh, to, to write a, a review on. So uh, all of these people submitted, you know, selected a student or they were assigned a student. 134 uh, students were selected to be all stars. They wrote a, a, a you know, a short uh, 144 character review. Uh, and then um, we're now in the process of getting those produced as uh, a publication. So we're gonna produce uh, an edition of 500 cards in, in decks of, 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 of uh, 50 card decks, so there'll be 10 decks. Uh, so we're in the process and, and at the next time we meet, we should have our, our, uh, our funding system set up so that if you wanna get a particular deck with one of your students or an entire set. And the, and the goal is, you know, our students went through this process of, of um, of having their, their senior exhibitions and their BFA and MFA exhibitions canceled and, and moved online. And we were really concerned about making an opportunity for us to make a physical version of their work. So um, we're really excited to be working on this. It's taken longer than I and we anticipated. I thought we thought we'd be done by now, but uh, Photofika is volunteer. And most people are doing things uh, as a side thing. So we're really excited to um, bring that to you when, when it gets further along. But we've got all of the, we've got a designer working on it right now. So uh, we should be able to share things with that. So what I love is with, with Concept Board out, outside of this is that like you can send a link. You don't have to have an account. You can log right in. You've got your name. Uh, and and this is what happens. Like I've done this with students. <laughs> I've done this with students. Uh, you know, after seeing this two weeks ago, and uh, it just happens, which I love. So, um, I think with that, uh, what I'd like to do is stop sharing my screen. It's four thirty-three. Uh, we we have some expertise here on the line. Right. And I'd like to talk more uh, about what's being, what's useful and successful for people. So I'm so going to pass it to Anne. So we've had a lot of um, comments in the chat about Miro being another app that um, functions similarly. similarly. And we've also added, um, although um, with a couple of typos, uh, the um, address for concept board. Everybody appears frozen to me. I don't know if you, if I am frozen to you. I can see you. I can see you. Ah, can okay. See. Okay. Just checking. Yeah, we can see you. Um, great. 
Um, and then the other um, thing that we wanted to share is that Ben Guest, who um, teaches at ICP, is also um, has also developed a piece of software called Ache, and he has indicated interest in joining us um, and running through his program, um, which uh, is is built specifically for photographers, specifically for the classroom, and specifically with the critique in mind. So I mean I guess we're we're the 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 goal would be to open this up to a conversation specifically about critique, but other things that we're doing in the classroom that have been successful this fall. So um, yeah, is, is Betsy gonna we we almost I, had a silence there. Can yeah, you, we can. Yeah. Okay, I was I was muted like I couldn't unmute myself. It was a it was a test in this idea of silence, <laughs> this idea of being silent. Um, which presents a lot of new um, dimensions. Anyway, I think one thing too I'd like to throw back to is as we are talking about all this, um, and Arthur, I really appreciated your your uh, strategy of having the students pick on each other, pick on each other, choose each other. I mean, I, I do think that that's a huge part of um, what's important that we're doing is is connecting them to each other and helping them connect with each other in ways that they would, they, they do it without us a lot more, but it's really hard when it's remote. Um, so I think that that's important. And John, I just wanted to, to comment too on your, your observation about we've become like the other teachers, right? That how much doing stuff with the students is really an important part of either being next to them or experimenting with them or showing them things and, and, what a, for me, it's a little bit of a, of a loss of identity as a teacher, um, having to reinvent that. So I would ex just extend the questions and, and play on that is how do we get there, right? Or how are you getting there? How are you making things work? And the other question I have is like, what is our job right now, really? What do you feel like your job is? <laughs> or did I just kill all the questions? I mean, I'm happy to share what I'm doing. I teach at a community college, so, and I, I actually looked at Miro and I went, I oh, know this is so over the capacities of my students who already feel very technically challenged, especially for something like photo one. So I'm using Padlet and um, ahead of time, at least with my level two classes, um, they're all assigned to give feedback to another student before class even starts. So they, um, you know, have to have everything in 48 hours before a critique. And then they have, um, you know, until an hour before class. So I always have everything do an hour before class because I don't want to start class and see all these faces down working on what they're supposed to have turned in for that class. Um, and I am using Blackboard, our learning management system for some things, which is really cool. I don't like it, but Padlet seems to be working. Um, they enjoy it. It looks like Instagram. It's pretty easy. It's drag and drop. Um, I'm using columns. There's many ways to do it, but I'm using columns for each different thing. And like one of my advanced classes, a documentary class, every week we have a photo share. There's a theme, an issue we're looking at, and they all have to put pictures in. And they actually enjoy it. They tell me they enjoy that. So that's good. But with like the photo one students, it's a challenge, you know, and I haven't actually started requiring them yet to do the evaluations ahead of time. But this week in class, I'm going to take a good half hour at the main class and say, okay, you look at the person's work below you and you give them written feedback and give them some prompts. So I feel like it's very helpful to give prompts for all these um, uh, critiques uh, that they're, I'm asking them to give, you know, and because otherwise they'll just use words like, it's nice. I like it. I like the colors, as Betsy said. So that seems to be working, but for me, it's still just about the lack of energy. Um, it is really hard. So I would love, yeah advice on that, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Thank, thanks so much. Um, and Padlet was also something that Marnie Schindelman recommended and, and, and used. Again, that's another thing that like you can get people involved in and they can start using it right away. Uh, and it's live. So, you, you know, it's, it's like what we're seeing on concept board, but we're looking at images. It's in the same format that, that, that people are familiar with from social media. Um, what other things are we doing to engage our students? And I think, I think rapport is, is difficult to do, to generate the rapport. So I, I, I really appreciated, uh, you know, some of the, Arthur and I do some of the same things uh, as icebreakers. And it was great to hear that the things that he does are working um, 
in the online space because I have students draw to on, on the first day of class. I have them draw themselves holding their favorite ice cream cone in the place that they would be holding their camera if they were doing a selfie. I like to make it as, as convoluted as possible. Uh, and, and I generate, you know, I, I've got stacks of these, these really amazing, uh, you know, terrible drawings of my, of my photo students. But I love that you then have them rephotograph them. So, which was, and that's, and that's in your presentation, which we can link to and, and all of that. Uh, so what other things are working for people or not working? I mean, I think, I think the, um, I do think that the, uh, uh, the question of, of, of having people screens on is, 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 a, is a conversation that we've been having on Photofica since, since in the spring, because a lot of people are in, in Zoom fatigue and don't want to be on screen until uh, they're presenting or, or, or not at all. And part of that is, is, are they there? Like, are they engaged? Right. Or are they like, you know, doing what I do when my screen is off, which is, you know, go to get a cup of coffee. It's one of one of the things I was thinking about. It's funny because because Anne was frozen and she was sending me a text, and I, I I got the text where she says I'm back on, and I looked at her, but she doesn't know I was looking at her, and I was like looking at her, being like, got it, and that's like something that's lost, right? And I one of the th strategies I've been trying to think about is using students' names more often, and trying to really make them feel like I see them. Yeah. And um, it's hard because I think it's hard. I mean, at least their names in Zoom are on the, on the screen. But um, I feel like that's, I, that's just one strategy. I've been, I've been really kind of pushing myself to really not just know their names, but remember their situations. And you know, remember the student whose dad died in March. You know, remember the, not that I'm going to bring that up all the time and I'm not laughing about it, but remember, remember when they've told you stuff and uh, anyway, that's, that's just like, that's makes an extra burden on, on us, I think, like holding all this, all this space. But I feel like that's been something that's been really important is just remembering things about them. And the drawing is great. Like this idea of, of other ways of connecting with them that can help trigger our memories too, I think. Betsy, you're right on that, remembering their names, because that, that's what made my students a little bit more engaged in the last couple of weeks, because I've made a point to, as I'm talking to them, writing them down. And like, when we're watching on Zoom, we can see the green, the, the, our, our little square light up, we know who's talking. But when you're doing a presentation, you don't see that. And so having to remember, writing, like writing down who's in class. So I'm writing down those names in front of me, who's there partic that particular day, who's turned in what. So when I do say it, I can say, yeah, remember when uh, I can say their name in reference to what the work that they showed or what they said earlier. And that's, that's helped a whole lot recently because I didn't do that in the beginning as much as I do now. And that's the way that I've been able to reinvigorate or get them to participate in class a lot more often when I call them or relate something they said in that day specifically to their name. That has helped a whole lot. It's good. You, you don't want to feel like a used car salesman, you know, the kind of people that are too familiar and use your name too much, you know, but I, I think it's, it's better to, to err on that side now. Well, and I would imagine, Arthur, that especially because I think we also um, did Zoom conditioning in that first um, few months where, you know, the very first thing that we told our students to do was to, to mute themselves. Um, that background noise, this idea of participating in this space was different than the classroom, um, the in-person classroom. And so therefore there were new rules that we immediately placed on these spaces and it conditioned them to engage in a particular way. And I would imagine, I'm not teaching this semester, but I would imagine that calling that name provides an opportunity for the response um, reaction um, and to, to engage in a space where the mute isn't um, the constant. Yeah, can I, I jump in for a sec? Yeah, yeah, yeah everybody yeah. can jump in. Yeah, please do. <laughs> today, so today, my Zoom crit critique today was the first time I've actually met with my students via Zoom because we because, well, honestly, we don't have any internet in Lake Charles right now. So we're working off of our hotspots on our phones. And so I didn't want to make it a required thing. And um, my class is so tiny. This is my advanced photo class. I only have six. 
And the very first thing I said was just unmute yourself. Like there are a few enough people here that it's okay, unless you've got, you know, a dog like really barking in the background. It's okay if we hear your background noise because I couldn't see any of them. And, um, and it made it, it made it a lot easier to just be like, oh, hey, Larry, okay, so you're working on this. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about this without the, like that just nanosecond that it takes to unclick. So I think with a small class, encouraging them to not be muted um, unless they're not comfortable with it um, is, is totally, I, I really enjoyed it today. And I'll say too, like last semester when I was teaching um, our senior seminar, and we were in those first weeks of Zoom and we didn't, I didn't know what I was doing and they didn't know what they were doing. And I, and I never, I never asked them to mute themselves. Um, but they started asking, oh, well, my other professors are saying, will you mute yourself? Um, but I never, I never did. And it really like, I felt like it made the conversation flow a lot better, you know, except for in, in moments where I was like giving a presentation or something, but in critique situations or discussion, just to kind of accept whatever background noise might be there as okay. Um, I, I thought it was, I thought it was okay. And, and, you know, one of the things that's happening with, with both Zoom and, uh, Google Meet and all of them is that they are getting better at getting rid of uh, background noise. So if your students are, if you're, you know, if your students are wearing a headset, if they're wearing headphones, uh, if they have a, a microphone, I found a really cheap microphone set uh, that are it's twenty dollars. That's made by Sennheiser. Uh, that works fantastic. It's a USB set. I'm happy to send the link to it, and it and you know not that everyone needs to look like a gamer, uh, but it it does a really good job of isolating their voice, and they can they can be unmuted and still be able to engage and in interact with us. So, um, that's yeah. I mean, right. I, th I think anything we can do to to like bring ourselves into the into the to it, I don't know to like acknowledge that we're in physical space is also important. Like I've I've. I have a second webcam or one thing that Nick um, used, uh, Nick Shepard used was just a second phone to call in. And, 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 you know, by having this second phone as a, as a, as another guest in the classroom, uh, he was able to, you know, move around the space that he was in and you kind of get a sense of the physicality of it. So, um, yeah, so I, I've been, I just did a thing today where I was training people to use naloxone, Narcan, uh, and the second camera allowed me to like show them the physical space. So I'm going to show you like what my desk looks like. You know, and I can write things. I can, let's see. Yeah, I think Betsy, oh yeah, so you see, uh, I can write on it. So you can draw anything that, that creates this like opportunity for them to see that we're actually in physical space as opposed to this, uh, you know, this flat space that we're, we're constantly in. That's, I just have a thought. It's a tangent, total Betsy tangent. Um, Ragnar um, Carls, Carlson's um, The Visitors, if any of you guys have ever seen that, have you, if you, you need to see that if you haven't, but it's a, a nine screen video installation um, that takes place in a, in a single house, which I may be giving it away, but it's, it's something, it actually, it, it actually, when you said that, John, it really made me think about how we can activate spaces. Um, and Rosemary and Anne too, both those are things I hadn't even thought of, this idea of, of um, letting them, and maybe there is a kid in the background and maybe that's okay. Like, I mean, there's back and forth between respecting people's privacy, but also like acknowledging that we're present in this physical space and it's important to um, encourage people. I think that that's really, that's super helpful for me with the smaller classes. Something, something I've been doing, I'm recording lectures through Zoom for my other classes, like demos and stuff. And I always have like a little intro and I think it, it, part of it is for my own entertainment, but I hope that they find it too. And I'm just realizing now that it's, it's acknowledging my physical space. I change up my, my like background area 
um, <laughs> to like what's behind me or um, I kind of move around my studio and, um, and just have different vantage points of my physical space, not throughout the lecture, but from lecture to lecture. It's like, okay, now we're talking about this and Rosemary's in front of her personal critique wall or whatever. But just, it, I think over time, it gives a real description of the studio slash office space that I'm working in. That, that actually brings up another point that loops back into what, I mean, I don't want to say we're, we're super special because we teach art, <laughs> but I do think one of the things that's always struck me for, from being an art professor, and, and, and I do work that's, I have done work that's intensely kind of personal so that my story, my life story is not a secret. Um, and I think that not all artists function this way, but a lot of us do. And, and a lot of the ways in which we connect with students is by showing who we are and having the, our practice and our teaching and our lives be part of what we bring to the classroom. And I think what you're saying, um, Rosemary, is that it, it, it becomes a dimension of how we're approaching it in terms of Zoom. I, so that's, for me, that's, it's, this is very interesting about um, how, again, how do we translate what makes, I would say what makes art education special um, to this situation that's threatened to flatten things. Um, so, so we have about 10 minutes and um, one of the things that we recognize um, in opening up the can of worms that is the conversation about of critiques is that um, there are multifacets to it that um, uh, we're all trying to find our way through. And so, you know, part of it is introducing a new piece of software and um, having an opportunity to um, see how it might function within your own classroom. But are there particular um, uh, um, related topics to the critique that would be useful for us to bring to this group? Um, we are, or do you as an individual have um, um, something that you think would be um, you know, um, worth us spending some time in conversation with, because obviously this has been collaborative from the, from the very beginning. And, um, you know, we want to, we want to make sure that the conversation is as robust as it can be. So, um, feel free to, to make suggestions as well. Um, I have a question. Oh. Sorry, Sandra. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to add, and this is relatively brief, uh, I taught three online digital photography classes last year at the end of the year, and then I'm getting ready to teach another one um, Monday because we do blocks. So I have a small group of students. And when I had 12 students, I broke up the group into three groups to do the um, critiques. And I found it went really, really well. And I was just curious if anybody else tried that because it felt like with only five or four students per group that they all felt like it was very important for them to participate and they did. And I liked it a lot. Um, so I was just throwing that out there to say or to ask what you think about that. Sandra, can you just explain, did you then lead each group? Yes. So what did, and what did you have them doing while you were in the different groups, I guess? Oh. We had specific times. They didn't have to appear in class at a dozen, you know, like at 1.30, it was just group A and at 2.30, it was group B and or whatever. Yeah. I, otherwise, I felt like it was an extra long day to go through 15 different critiques um, online. I mean, you do it in the classroom or I do it in the classroom, but I felt like being online with somebody for that amount of time was a little bit too much. So I really liked the littler groups, the smaller groups. Um, I didn't do that with my really small classes, but I'm definitely planning on doing that again this coming block. And I just wondered if anybody else had. I think I'm thinking of the time and um, I'm thinking this is a, these are really good I mean, it's what Anne just asked for, because I'm also seeing that, that Michael has a, has a question about how social media has influenced student, the way students are teaching, um, whether you're being conservative, holding on to old ideas, that there's value. 
So I would like to like say both those things sound great. And I think that um, Sa Sandy, your, your point, you know, I think it's something for all of us to take back and, and think about that strategy and the size and what that means. Um, I'm not trying to end the conversation. I just feel like there's stuff to say. And I know that Libby also had something to say. And, and before we open it up to Libby, um, Sandy, the reason, I, so I've posted a, or a sort of a um, question slash statement in there is that I think part of what, depending upon how long we're all in this online environment, um, you know, do we have institutional support for, um, you know, class strategies that um, make the sense that they do for the discipline and the instructor and the students that we have. Um, for example, our continuing education classes here at ICP are actually being reduced in size. So we're going from a 15 cap that we would have typically had in a physical space. And we're taking that down to eight to 12 because it's untenable, untenable to be in that online environment and have that many students in a class and still get the same kind of um, delivery and um, results. Uh, and, Libby. And yeah, Libby, go ahead. I can wait, John, if you wanted to add to that. Oh, I was just going to say, and that's the opposite of, of what most of our institutions are doing. They're like, oh, it's online. Uh, let's make the cap 20 because it's easier. And it's like, or, or, or scale beyond 50, but not yeah. naming any institutions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Libby, sorry. Yeah, I feel like my institution is seen by that comment. Um, what I was going to ask, um, because I am, I am thankful to normally get to just teach advanced in grad classes, so my classes are relatively small, but I am venturing into teaching a, an, an asynchronous larger scale class next semester, and like that is completely out of my wheelhouse, asynchrony, asynchronicity and then like figuring out how the students get any value from a class like that. I, I, if anybody has suggestions or has that experience and is willing to share with me, I'd be happy to like message with you after or whatever. Libby, talk to me about it. Talk to Granville who's right there. <laughs> I do just pulled him in. Um, but I think that would be a good, a good bigger discussion to have too. Um, What's yeah, possible I mean, I, and what's not possible? Go ahead, John. Sorry. Well, I, and I think I think that is a question as we move forward. The easiest thing for us to do is to move to synchronous, right? Because that's what we're familiar with. Um, but but in terms of the online space, there's a lot we can do with asynchrony. You know, so like there's a lot we can and that and that's something that Marnie Schindelman, if you want to go back to the photo fika when we had her on. Uh, talked about is that like there's a lot that we can do where the students are doing work outside of the classroom and when when we do come in we're not using the you know the full class time that we would normally be in space because because zoom zoom fatigue is real right so like when you know we're operating in a model where the schools are like a class is this number of credit hours which is this number of contact hours and 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 their answer is to go synchronous where you just occupy their time during that time slot. And, you know, that's not, you know, we're not going to be able to support that forever, right? Like we, we have to move, uh, you know, we have to move pieces of this to be, to, to be asynchronous because like it just doesn't work the same way. When students come in with work that they've done and really done the work and you have an opportunity to engage with it, uh, you know, you don't need you know, four hour blocks twice a week. So, uh, you know, and I think that's a good conversation for all of us to have Libby and, and, and Marty, Marty shared a lot of great resources specifically about kind of that kind of time shift, but also, you know, using the synchronous time that you have efficiently and effectively. Yeah, that's where my challenge is with this is there's no synchronous time. Yeah. In this yeah. class yeah. that I'm doing. And it, yeah, I would hate that. It's, I just don't know what I'm going to do. It's a challenge and not to jump in, but this, yeah. I mean, this is what we've been trying to do at ASU and been trying to figure out how to make it work and to varying degrees of success, I think. Um, but we've been doing it for about four years. So um, we're talking 50 and that's what I, 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 I do the line at 40 and I got pushed to 50 and they're still kind of pushing us. Um, so, I mean, we can talk about strategy. I'd be interested in having like a chunk of a photo fika session, just talking about that. Um, I also want to talk about uh, Michael. I want to come back to that question because I think that that's, that's really an excellent question too about what do we hold on to? 
and what don't we hold on to? And, and Libby, that loops into your question too. What, you know, how much of what we learned is still valuable? I mean, I believe a lot of it is, but I do think like, how do we adapt and still hold on to, not to, to make, reduce your questions to, to something facile, but I think that these are discussions that are really important to have. But, you know, our students have been clicking like for 15 years, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So their engagement with things is, is, is mostly positive. That's awesome. More of that. Uh, and then the reverse of that is you're terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't stand this. So there's like the, the nuance and the gray that is where we operate best, uh, you know, doesn't, is not reflected in the way social media works. So, you know, we have yes. To get there. Yes, uh, Padlet works great because it's familiar to them, but does that also engender a kind of, 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 of likiness that prevents a, a, a larger and more interesting conversation from happening? I turn off the likes and the stars. <laughs> I, but even with my in-person students this semester, I don't think I have had a single, a single critical comment made by a student. So I look like a total jerk, but also that, that it's about me. But I really try. And if I say something negative, a student will jump in to defend, defend, oh, I actually like that sign in the way, you know, or, I mean, it's just uncanny. Um, and I don't know, how did we get here? I think we do know how we got here. How do we get out of here? And that is uh, time for another week, right? Anne, is that what you were going to say? Uh, well, yeah, well, I was going to attempt to go down a, a road that's a slippery slope. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yes, it, it's absolutely time for that to be another, another topic. I think, um, I, I think the question is, what does photo education want our students to engage in in the process of critique? Um, and, uh, you know, being critical about the images that they and their colleagues are producing. Um, and as the educators, we are the people who help to frame the environment that they will do all of those things in. Um, and so while popular culture, um, we look, our, our instructors hated our popular culture, you know, um, uh, and they, uh, you know, we, we are, we are railing against a similar machine. Um, but uh, it is it is for us to, to define. All right. Well, uh, do I see Arthur or did Arthur slip away? Right next to you on my screen. Oh, okay. Uh, can we thank Arthur for, for, for joining us? And if you, if you haven't seen his presentation, uh, check it out because uh, it's awesome and was really helpful to me. Yeah, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you again, and thank you for joining us, and thanks everybody for being here. One last thing, the TikTok link and the, um, they're both there, and the, um, why can't I remember the room, the, the room of silence? I already got you, Betsy. I, I oh, put them in the Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Can you take care of stuff? <laughs> and and we're, we're trying to work to be a little bit more posty on, on Photofica and sending it to photography professors and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, when I find cool things, I'm sharing it there. And we hear you loud and clear about asynchronous and um, thankfully Betsy has some experience with that. Yeah. yeah, and it sounds like there's some other people. So we'll, we'll plan, a, plan a session to talk, talk a little bit more of that, about that, or maybe a lot more. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and Libby, send us, send, send me a message. Send me a Granville message. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take care. Be well. Take care, y'all. Right. Thanks for coming. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Eighteen percent. Good job. <laughs> I made it. You made it. You made it. All right. All right, I gotta, I gotta run. I gotta All find. Right. You guys are great, even with low energy and like people showing up. Yeah. Wow. Good. Nice right. to see ya. Yeah. All right, guys. All right. All right. We'll ciao, ciao. Much. All right. See you soon. Bye. 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 -bye.